So the question today in the form of a message, should I say, yes, in the form of a message, is kind of like everyday language among men. And the title of today's message is, hey man, how you doing? You know, we greet each other like that. Hey, man, how you doing? And most of the time, nine times out of ten, and in this message, I want to I be asking as we are teaching and preaching this message, hey, man, hey, fathers, how are you doing? A lot of times, this greeting is commonly used in today's culture among People who know each other. We, that's how we greet each other. And some of us get a little bit more fancy and we get a little, use a little bit more slang. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, bro? I, what, what, what's the latest thing among young people? Uh, Jamal, what's the, what's the latest thing? How y'all speak? Y'all just, y'all just do like that? So. <laughs> he said he ain't young no more, so he don't know. <laughs> That's why I love him, and I love him, I love him. And, 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 so, and so most men who know each other, they feel comfortable enough to speak to one another in this fashion. But the truth of the matter is, when you ask this question or someone else asks you this question, your response is always, I'm doing good. I'm doing well. Everything is everything. You ever heard that before? Uh, it's all good. I can't complain. If I did, nobody want to listen. We, we say better than good, better than most. Some say glad to be above ground. Others might say glad to be on this side of the dirt. And so most of our answers are cordial and pleasant. But after we have continued the conversation for a few minutes, the real truth comes out. Have mercy. Don't get quiet now. The real truth comes out after we talk for a little while and we find out that we're not doing all right. We, we, we find out that we're not well. We're not doing better than most. As a matter of fact, uh, how you doing, man? Uh, we're doing worse than most. We are in survival mode. A lot of times when we ask how we're doing, the truth of the matter is that we're barely making it. A lot of times as fathers, we are depressed. We're smiling, man, but we're depressed. We're smiling, but we're hurting. We're, about, we're just about to give up. In our, we're, 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 we're just about to give up. We're, 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 we're about to give up in our physical pain. We're, we're about to give up because we have psychological pain. We have so much spiritual pain. At some point, a lot of times, we are tired. We're, we're tired of trying. Just tired of trying. It's me and now. This, this is the one that just said, how you doing, man? I'm good. Hard hurting feel used, feel like, how much more can I give? But you just said, better than good, better than most. And so you got to understand, it's not the words that you respond, the words you respond with, it really tells you uh, what's going on with you, what's really going on with you is on the inside. And I'm persuaded, that's why so many men die of heart attacks and strokes and and all of this stuff because they got so much going on and we're trying to pretend like everything is all right. And sometimes we don't have no help. Sometimes the ones that we love the most is the ones that kick us around the most. And we wonder, are we going to make it? And so we, you, so you carrying, you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulder as men, as fathers, and and and, and at odds with your family, at odds with your wife, at odds with your children, uh, at odds with your siblings, your brothers and sisters that you grew up with can't even get along with them, and and, and, and you and you in and in odds with your cousins and your in-laws and outlaws, full of doubt, hate life. Faith at an all-time low. Angry with God. Everything you touch turn to mud. But you just said, I'm good. 
bitter, blaming everybody for your past failures, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So remember, men, I need you to remember this. In order to fulfill your destiny in this earth, because God called. I'm talking to godly men. I'm not talking to men who are not saved and don't know the Lord. I'm talking to godly men. Fathers, men, in order for us to fulfill our destiny in this earth and be the vessel that God called us to be, to take care of what we have to to, to take care of ourselves first, and, and, and be a blessing to our immediate family and then to our fellow men. We got to make sure. We got to make sure. We got to make sure that we let go of some stuff. We focus in on why I'm out here. Brother, father, man of God, you must ask yourself, why am I here? Why am I still here? And it's to fulfill your destiny in the earth. I've got something at the end of this message. I'm going to say it right now. It was a quote by Billy Graham. And Billy Graham quoted. He said this, and I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to quote it. The famous Billy Graham once said that a good father, listen to me. A good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. A good father is one of the most unsung. It's like he's not appreciated. He's one of the most unpraised. It's like everybody get the glory but him. He worked hard. He sacrificed. He went to work sick. He at least didn't leave his family. He stayed there. He fussed. He had a problem, he had an issue, but he still took care of his responsibilities. Unsung, unpraised, unnoticed. So you know what that tells me? That as men of the living God, we got to make sure that God is pleased with us, not folks, not people. We got to make sure that, God, that we're doing what God called us to do. We've got to make sure that we're walking in the will of God. We've got to make sure that we're fulfilling God's plan in our life in this earth. We've got to make sure that our eyes is on the prize, our eyes is on Jesus, because as a godly man, you are not going to make it. You got, there's so many things against us. Society is against a righteous man. The world is against a righteous man. Society and, 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 uh, and the enemy is against righteous men. That's why the devil talked to God and asked him, could he, could, could, could he touch Job? But that's not the old story about the devil asking God or asking Jesus. In this, in this particular scripture in the New Testament, we're getting ready to go there now. The devil asked Jesus if he could touch Peter. And, and, and so we see here that, that, that then you, you can be a blessing to your immediate family and then to your fellow man. But the thing that we have to do first is we've got to make sure that we take care of ourselves. So men, remember, in order to fulfill your destiny in the earth and be the vessel God called you to be, you must take care of yourself first. Somebody said first. That's, I'm talking about having a relationship with God. Then you've got to start taking care of yourself. You have to take care of your physical being, and you have to take care of your mental health. If you are not strong physically, if you cannot work, if you cannot function, if you cannot think, if you cannot have the mind of Christ through your thinking, if you can't process things and analyze things, you are going to be unable to help anybody else, particularly those that are around you. And so Jesus tells Peter this, and I love what he tells Peter over in Luke chapter 22, verse 31 through 32. He tells Peter, he says, Simon, 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 Peter, listen. He says, Satan has asked excessively that all of you, be given up to him out of the power in keeping of God. So you have to understand some fathers. Sometimes the enemy has to go before God and say, can I, can I, can I touch brother so-and-so-and-so? Can I test him, Lord? And it says that out of the power of keeping of God that he might sift all of us 
are all of you like grain and wheat. And then Jesus come back, says, he said, the devil, devil want to sift you. The devil want to cause you to crumble and fall. But Jesus came back and says, but I have prayed especially for you, Peter. Now, this is at the Last Supper, so Jesus already know what Peter getting ready to do. He's trying to let him know, look, man, you're getting ready to deny me. Peter, Peter got his st- chest all stuck out. Like, man, Jesus, we tight. Where you go, I go. You die, I die. I'm going to protect you. He cut off the man's ear. But Jesus already told him, look, man, when you get by that fire and they start asking you questions about me, you're going to act like you don't even know me. <laughs> and, 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 and so we see here it says, but I have, Jesus said, he told Peter, he said, but I have prayed especially for you, Peter, that your own faith may not fail. And when you yourself have turned again, when you have repented and turned again to me, strengthen and establish your brethren. And so we see here that Jesus is telling us, he's telling the men, he's telling the fathers, look, you got to take care of yourself. And when you take care of yourself, you will be able to take care of somebody else. When you will be able to be an example, you'll be able to have the strength and the fortitude. To, to fulfill your destiny in the earth. At the last supper, Jesus warned Simon Peter that a test of faith was coming. He says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you as wheat, which means that he wanted to shake Peter's faith so vehemently, so violently that he would fall. The enemy is still against godly men. He's still against fathers who want to serve the Lord. His job is to make sure that we don't produce what we're supposed to produce, that we make mistakes, that we fall, that we're the talk of the town, that we stop producing, that our influence is killed. He wants to destroy our character, our reputation. We know a whole, we talk about a whole lot of no good men, but how many of us talk about good men? Why can't we focus on good men? Why can't we build up men that are trying? Why can't we uh, get behind men who, who, who are trying to serve the Lord, who are trying to live right, who are trying to deal right, deal, uh, uh, do right? Men who love their families for real, but they have been through so much in their life until they miss it sometimes. As women of the living God and wives of these husbands and wives of, your, uh, of these men, we got to make sure that we continue to support them and pray for them and encourage them. We need, more, we need encouragement more than one time a year. I can't get no help, but I'm going to help myself. I need somebody to encourage me sometime every other day, sometime every day. Sometimes, fathers, we need encouragement every second of the day. Why don't you get in the dictionary and find some good words to tell us so that we can stay strong and stay on the battlefield? I know we say as, as, as the family goes, so go the nation. But I want to stop by to tell you today, as the man goes, as the father goes, so goes the nation. It, 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 it's, not, it's not the sin of the women that got us, our four, the, the women before us that got us in trouble. The Bible always talk about the sins of the forefathers. So we see here that it was not just Peter who was in danger, but all of the disciples. Satan is still trying to shake godly men, godly fathers, and Christian brethren today. And here again, we got to help them. Look, don't make them fall. Don't help them fall. Don't trip them up. My Lord, don't trip them up. So we see here when we talk about sift as wheat, it's a metaphor that could also be expressed as shake something apart or break a person down. We got some Christian folk, boy, they can talk about men worse than anybody I ever seen. Shake them from the neck down to the toes. And I want you to understand that your words have power. And however you want your husband to be or however you want the father, your father to be, that's what you got to speak. I don't care how he's living. I don't care what he's doing. You got to speak the right things over his life. Don't allow the enemy to use you to be Satan to shake and sift 
and break a person down and shake and separate them. And so in sifting Peter and the other disciples as weak. So, 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 so the devil not only wanted to sift Peter, but he wanted to sift the other disciples. Because you know he can kill the disciples. If he can make them uh, bag down, then, then all of that teaching Jesus and all that time he spent with the disciples teaching and training them, it would be for naught. And so uh, Satan's goal was to crush them and to wreck their faith. In truth, the adversary wants to destroy the faith of every believer. And he'll use anything he can to do it. He'll use, watch this, he'll use the very thing that we like and love to turn around and sift us. That's why you got to be careful what you spend your time and your energy and what you meditate on and what you love. Seek ye first the kingdom. You can't love this stuff because it's a setup. Satan would use something that you think is a blessing and use it against you to sift you. Anybody ever been in a bad relationship? It wasn't bad when you first got in it. Y'all just loved each other. You couldn't do without each other. You couldn't go nowhere without each other. You talked all the time. You couldn't get along without each other. You were mad if somebody else was around and taking up the time and the space of the other one. And time went on and situations happened and life happened. And now, let me move on because I'm moving in the wrong direction. But Jesus answered Peter. He says, I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. Isn't that amazing what Jesus told Peter that I'm praying for you, man? That's powerful. That's powerful. That's powerful. And see, I need you to understand something, uh, men of God. I want you to understand some fathers that Jesus is still praying for us. Can you believe that? Do you know that? He prayed for Peter. He told Peter to his face, I'm praying for you. But I've got a scripture that proves that he's still praying for us. The Bible says in Romans 8, 31 C, he says, Jesus right now is at the right hand of God, actually pleading as he intercedes for us. That's why when you pray, you got to say, Father, get his attention in the name of Jesus. Now, when you said Jesus, he's ever interceding for us. When you say in the name of Jesus, Father, Father God forgets everything that we've done. He forgets all the problems, all the issues, all the sin. He forgets all about that, all our shortcomings, what we're not doing. He forgets all about that. And he listens to Jesus talk to him about us. He listens to Jesus talk to him on our behalf. So glad I've got somebody that cares about me other than somebody in flesh and blood. Say other than somebody that loves me today and might not like me tomorrow. I got to have somebody constant in my life and his name is Jesus and God is my helper. So father in the name of Jesus help me and Jesus hears and said we're going to help that boy. We're going to help him. We're going to help him. We're going to help him because he's trying. We're going to help him because he's trying to live right. He ain't perfect, but he's trying to do right. We're going to help him. Jesus, get what Father, Father God, and Father God and Jesus has. Oh, they have a conversation, and then they connect to the Holy Ghost that's on the inside of us. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost gets together and help us in all our troubles and our problems and our stresses and our turbulence. And that's why men of God, that's why fathers, when, when you feel like giving up and you can't, that's because the Holy Ghost didn't grab you, man. When you want to walk away and you can't, that's because the Holy Spirit has been ordered and put on commission, put on a mission by God the Father and God the Son. That we're going to hold this brother up. He is not going to lose his mind. He's going to have the strength to endure. He's going to have patience. He's going to have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, gentleness. He's going to be temperate. They say pressure, if it gets too great, we'll bust a pipe. Believe that a lot of our brethren are having heart attacks and dying early and stroke it out 
and giving up and losing their mental health because of the pressures of this life and situations. See, the problem with walking away is you can walk away from, 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 from this and walk into what? Another problem. You walk away from this situation and you walk into another situation worse. We always say it this way. You drop, you jump out of the frying pan into the what? I know the frying pan was hot, but you done jumped out. Now you're in the fire, baby. But I noticed what Jesus told Peter. He said, look, he said, so when you have repented, when you've turned around. So men, when we see that we that we, we, we messed up, when we see that we haven't done things exactly like God wanted us to do or told us to do. And we know we've made mistakes here and there. We made mistakes maybe with our family, made mistakes on, on a job with our friends. We made mistakes with our with our own blood siblings. We made mistakes. Jesus said, when you realize that, when the Holy Spirit on the inside of you shows you that, then what you need to do is repent. Ask God to forgive you. Turn around. In other words, stop doing that and do better. Stop doing that and do what God wants you to do. And so he says, when you repent, he didn't just say, when you repent, go on and run. He didn't say, when you repent, go on about your business. He said, when you repent, then turn around and strengthen your brother. So I can't help you until I help myself. And once I help myself, then I still need to come. See, the God that helped, oh, my Lord, the God that got me out and helped me to have a sound mind and helped me to move forward, that God told me, don't be selfish. Go and help somebody else get out, too. Unless I keep you too long. The father is the one who sets the spiritual condition of the home. And so now that we're free and we repent it, then God wants us to make sure that we do what we're supposed to do concerning the household. Men of faith, men of the household. So as I move through this very quickly, Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7 says, And these words which I am commanding and amplified, and these words which I am commanding you this day should be first in your own minds and hearts. Here again, take care of yourself first. Make sure you're doing the commandments of God first. Make sure you're practicing them. You can't demonstrate something that you're not practicing. He says, make sure that they are in your heart, own minds and hearts. He says, and then you shall wit sharpen them so as to make them penetrate and teach and impress them diligently upon the minds and hearts of your children. When you are doing it, when you are trying to walk it out, when you are trying to figure it out and walk it out and letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide you, then you are able to teach it and impress it them diligently upon the minds of your children. He says, and shall take and, and shall talk of them when you sift when you when you sit in their house teachable moments and when you walk by the way teachable moments and when you lie down and when you rise up and I remember Joshua he challenged he challenged people with this statement he challenged uh, back in his day he challenged the whole nation back in Joshua 24 15 he says and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, some folks, they, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about them because they feel like every time you start talking about church and the Lord, they get mad. Hold on. Now, I ain't talking about folk that don't go to church and in the world and not say I'm talking about Christians who love the Lord because he heard their cry and pitied every groan. And as long as they live and trouble rise, they're going to haste around God's throne. I'm talking about those folk, when you start talking to them about living for the Lord and being faithful and doing what God called them to do, they get mad. Israel was God's chosen people, but when you start telling them the truth, when Joshua starts trying to tell them this is what we're supposed to do and this is what we should not do, they got mad. They got angry. So Joshua says that if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day who you will serve. Joshua said, I can't make y'all do anything. I can't stop you from doing anything. If God, the same God that brought me out of Egypt, brought you out of Egypt, the same God that kept you through the wilderness, kept me through the wilderness. But all of a sudden, you think you're better than God. You don't want to hear God. That's on you. 
I stopped by to tell somebody today, I personally, I really love you, I care for you, but I'm not going to let you stop me from doing what I'm supposed to do when it comes to serving God. God's been too good. He's too great. He's too special. He's too, oh my good, powerful. I just love him because of who he is. He's done too much for me. So if you decide you want to slow down, you decide you don't want to worship, you decide decide you don't want to come you decide that you want to do you you go ahead but as for me and my house he says he says whether the gods which your father serve on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites or whose land you dwell see we're supposed to be those of us who 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 are now adults and are fathers and have children, we're supposed to be better than our fathers. I'm sorry, but I got to take a little time right here. See, I know our dads didn't do a lot of things right. But, but before we judge our fathers, we got to check to see what kind of fathers did they have. I found out that my dad was doing the best that he knew how. So it's a possibility that your dad, with all the faults, he's probably doing the best that he knew how because his dad didn't teach him. So you got to understand how granddaddy was. So if his daddy didn't teach him, then he, did, he was unable to, to, to teach you. But the book needs to stop with you. You getting truth so that now you know exactly what to do. And where you start from is make sure you don't do what he did. You make sure you don't make the mistakes that he made. When you don't make the mistakes he made, that puts you in the 50, 60 percentile of doing what's right and knowing what to do. And so then you allow the word of God to come in and tenderize your heart and reprogram your mind and transform your mind so that you understand what it is that you're supposed to do. Once you understand what it is that you're supposed to do, then you ask God to help you through the Holy Spirit to perform it. And as you walk it out and you practice it, when you become a father, you're going to just be doing what you do and your son and your daughter's going to see what you're doing and they're going to walk it out. They're going to do CP. People, kids do what they see. They don't do what they hear. They do what they see. You don't have to say nothing to them. Close your mouth and just walk upright and watch them. At some point in their life, they're going to do what they saw. They do what they see. Why are you trying to preach to everybody? You need to live around everybody. I had to keep preaching to my son. He watching me. I want to tell him stuff every day. He's smart enough to know. At his age, at this point in life, he's smart enough to know. He says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And so remember that we got to teach our kids how to get to heaven. Because teaching our children how to get to heaven is more important than all the other responsibilities that we will have. Just because you cry over somebody when they're in the casket at a funeral don't mean you're going to see them again. You can cry all you want to. But if they're not saved and they're not in the Lord, yeah, you probably need to be crying because that's it. And so that's why Proverbs 20, 22, 6 is in the Bible about pointing your kids in the right direction and making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. I want to say this again. Fathers, man, y'all keep your heads up. And always ask yourself, how you doing? Hey, man, how you doing? And if you are in somebody's company that you can trust and they'll listen to you, tell them how you doing for real. Quit acting like everything is all right. That's what fellowship is all about. It's about talking to one another. I don't have a gripe session, but you can let the brothers know what you want them to pray for. And then sometimes we need to talk because the devil tell you, you're the only one going through this. 
Ain't nobody going through this but you. You see them brothers smiling and dapping each other up and having a good time at church? They ain't going through none of this. And the fact of the matter is, all of them going through the same thing. We just camouflage a little different. Some of us got bigger smiles. I've learned sometimes when people laughing all the time, they ain't laughing because they're happy. They laughing because they're hurting. They in pain. That's a protective mechanism that they put in. They laugh, they laugh, they laugh. I see, it, I see it do a lot of young folks. They laugh because they don't have confidence. They laugh because, you know, they hide and they laugh because they're in pain. And so, so you got to talk, man. Because guess what's important? The physical health, the mental health. People love to say something wrong with your mind. It could happen to any of us. I mean, when I was 15 years old and I lost my brother, one of the things the doctor told my mom, don't put him under any stress, none. No stress. And she didn't. And I was in a fog. I was paralyzing my thinking. I was just existing. Raised up in church. Understood God. But a great loss in my life that I could not explain, could not deal with, didn't know what to do. The things I did do, I kept going to church and I stayed in the midst of the saints. Are the memories still there? Yes. But the pain is gone. Hallelujah. See, the pain is gone. The bitterness, the depression, the confusion, the angry with God, the big question, why? Oh, that's gone. Because there's a lot that has happened between that time and now. And I'm older, I understand, I'm more mature. Sometimes, we don't understand why our fathers say what they say and do what they do. But we have to trust the God in them. Because they are the leaders. They are responsible. And so I want us to make sure that we help them and that we pray for them. And that we continue to lift them up. Because as the nation goes, or as the fathers goes, so goes the nation. God bless you.